the order came down to get up out of our foxholes and start advancing across this open land. We hadn't been on our feet 15 seconds when all hell broke loose. You are about to embark upon the Great Crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. October of 44, we were sent to, sent to England and trained there for 20 or 30 days, and then uh, across the channel into France. And I forgot how we crossed France in trucks or, or, or railroad cars, but the fighting was going on at the eastern end of France at that time, so we had to, we were taken to that area. In the middle of the night, we snuck up and, and into the relief of the 26th Division. So those guys climbed out of their holes and went back for some rest and, and, and food. And we took over, and, and so we're laying there in the dark starting around midnight, and we have the faintest idea of what the next day is going to bring. Uh, and as dawn broke, uh, we, we, we were out in, in farmland, so it was fairly flat. And uh, in, in the morning we got up, we didn't get up, no, nobody gets up out of a foxhole. You, you wake and open up your eyes <coughs> and looked out to see if we could see any movement of any kind <coughs> and not seeing any. Uh, when, it got, when, the, when it got light, about half an hour or so after it got light, the order came down to get up out of our foxholes and start advancing across this open land. So I would guess maybe 7 or 30, 8 o'clock, we started, we get up on our foxholes, started to advance across this land. We hadn't been on our feet 15 seconds when all hell broke loose. <coughs> 88 started coming in, machine guns, <coughs> machine guns opened up on us. Uh, seven of our men, uh, people I knew were down and injured or killed within the first 15 seconds. And I thought, what the hell is going on here? I just, you know, don't, I don't belong here. Get me out of here. <laughs> but uh, after that initial salvo, we, we kept advancing and, and got to a, ro a road junction after about a half a mile or so and, and dug in. Every time you stop, you start digging in because you don't know how long you're going to be there. And so we started digging in and we stayed there the rest of the afternoon. Uh, 88 screaming in, but uh, fortunately not killing anybody. Doug, uh, and so we, we moved a little bit further. On, our, on my left was a little stone monument, a little stone monument. On one side was Germany and one side was France. It was the, it, it was the border between the two countries. So, so that day was fairly quiet after that, but the next morning we got up and started to advance and 88s were picking us off because the 88 was so accurate and so powerful and so fast, uh, they could see us. Obviously, they could see us from the hills. They had spotters up there which were directing these, the incoming artillery. And uh, so, so during the day, the next day, uh, I can remember a couple of guys, one, uh, two buddies were killed and uh, one of them was wounded real bad high in the groin and we couldn't stop the bleeding and he, he just he's bleeding to death we couldn't stop it uh, and as he, he was dying he said I wish my brother was here to help me his brother was a doctor in Chicago uh, his friend the other one was killed a big piece of shrapnel hit him in the back uh, another man was wounded and, and, and in a ditch um, far over to my left and we thought he was dead, so we, we ignored him. And we kept heading towards this little town that we were trying to, uh, to attack and to, and to conquer. Uh, we, reached, we reached a place on a, a slight plateau above a town, the little town of over Galebach, and we dug in. There was a hill on our side of the, of the setting. Then there was this, the town and there was a slight Town was in lower town was in lower ground, and that, then it was a big hill, 360. That was we were going to attack that the, the next following day. So we dug in just above the town. We dug in in depth. One there was a couple of guys dug in right behind me, and, and there, were, there were Tiger tanks on the on the hill, 360 across from us. Uh, one of the tanks in a military 
strategy. You don't want the enemy to be above you, but the but they were above us. We couldn't help that. And uh, so one of these tiger tanks came out and stuck its nose out of the woods up on top of the hill and, and took a shot at us. And that shell came down, and, and it just it just screamed over my head. It couldn't have been, it couldn't have been more than that far above my head when it came down. Hit the hole behind me, killed three men in that hole. One of them was one of those real good sergeants that we were planning on helping us get through this mess. Uh, if that gunner up in that tank had been one click lower, they said by click, if it had been just one click lower, it, it would have taken me out. So I just I had so many close calls, and I, I thank God for preserving me and not letting me get not letting me get killed. So we uh, we slowly but surely moved into the town, and, and the Germans fled, went up into the hills, and, and we stayed there for one day before we got the order to attack Hill 360, which was occurred in the afternoon. Um, three of our guys, before that battle began, had a premonition that they were going to get killed that day, and. Uh, and all three of them got killed. It was unfortunate, just but it makes you wonder why why they thought they were going to get killed. So so we started up the hill. Uh, the Germans were dug in. We were we were firing at the Germans all the way up the hill. Uh, some of our guys were getting killed. Uh, those, those three friends of mine were all killed. And uh, I can remember Captain Jennings, a good captain, a good man. I can still see him. Running across the side of this angle across the hill, he had his 45 in his hand, blazing away at the Germans. It's unusual for you to see, see an officer of that rank doing that. Uh, in combat, I never once saw an officer above the rank of captain in combat. They were all watching, and, and rank has its privileges, I, I admit, but. Uh, None of them ever were up in, in the combat zone. They were always safe, con considerably safest. And um, so we we fought our way up the hill. Uh, the, the the tanks could not lower their guns to, to get at us, so thank God they were not involved. That would have made the battle a disaster. But we just kept tangling with their uh, infantry. Uh, I, don't, I know a good friend of mine, Wayne Harbaugh, wounded wounded a German soldier up halfway up the hill, and he turned his back to go fire some others, and this German pulled out a gun and, and was just about to shoot Harbaugh in the back when when uh, Jack Hui, one of our guys, saw that it was happening. He turned around quickly and killed the German. Um, and it was just it was just a, a very Violent, uh, fast-moving affair. So we get to we got to the top of the hill. There's a rock pile up there. The farmers, when they clean their land, they bring all the rocks to one place. So they made this big rock pile. In the middle of it was hollowed out. So I jumped in there, and uh, with an old first, an old army sergeant from from the, from the uh, he was in the army since '37 or '38. His name was Eugene Plants, and Plants and I were the closest two to the to the Germans. Now the Germans were in the woods, maybe 50 yards from us. And uh, if they if they if they made a counterattack, Plants and I would have been in serious trouble because we we didn't have any strong support, no machine guns around us. We were just rifles. So so it got dark, and uh, I was a private first class at the time. And around oh, 9 o'clock that night, the lieutenant came up and he, he, he said, Moran, he said, yeah, he said, Langston's dead. And Langston was my squad leader. And he said, you're the new squad leader. That's how you get, that's how you get a promotion on the battlefield. They, they, came, they came real easy. Yeah. And uh, I've got a bracelet here with Tom Langston's name on it about showing about where he was buried, where he is buried, and uh, I, I carry that with me. 
So it was a long night. I, a kid named Arthur Clemens came up and re relieved me late that night. Just he knew my a good friend of mine was wounded badly, so he said you want to, you might want to go down and see him. So his, his name was Leroy Edgar, a good good guy, a nice guy. So so I went back down the hill and and um, Clemens took my place in the rock pile for a while. I got down there. And here was Leroy Edgar. He was a funny guy in the first place, but they filled him full of morphine, so he was even funnier than than he normally was. So I, I bundled him up real good because it was cold, and in cold weather you can die from shock. Even on a minor wound, you can die from shock. So you've got to stay insulated and warm as possible. So I bundled him up and I said goodbye to him and. I didn't think at that moment that I would never see him again. When, so many situations where I saw people for the last time, and I looked back with, with regrets that I didn't get, you know, didn't some, that formal some, goodbye. Yeah, you know, and somehow established communication, post-war communication. But so anyway, I had to go back up the hill and and, uh, and relieve uh, Arthur, let Arthur go back down to his spot. So the rest of the night was fairly quiet. In the morning, late late that night, the L Company came up to relieve us, and so I got to, got to go back down the bottom of the hill. Uh, there was some big farm, it was farm country, so big farm barns down there, so we, we just go into those barns and flop on the floor and, and, and let the pent up uh, emotions and fear and we're hungry, we're thirsty, we're tired, we're exhausted. We've been, had a hard day. And uh, so that, 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 our battle on 360 was over. Right after, over Galebach and Hill 360, we went up and took a couple of little towns. And then at 10 o'clock at night, we were in foxholes around at one town. And the lieutenant came up and said, fellas, get out of here and get back into town. And nobody was coming up to relieve us. The, the division that was taking over, uh, nobody showed up, so we didn't. We wondered about that. Why are we? Why are we leaving these positions we took, and giving them up, giving them back to the Germans? But that was the beginning of it. We had to hike back about four or five miles to a place where some trucks were waiting for us to take us to the Germany, take us to the Bulgerider up in Belgium. And I, and I have a newspaper report in my paperwork there, titled "Pat Moves Third Army." to Belgium in, in, in three days. Eisenhower said it was impossible. And, but it was, Patton said he'd do it. But Patton, Montgomery volunteered to be there in four or five days, but Patton would not let Montgomery beat him. He hated Patton, he hated Montgomery. So he, he loaded us in those trucks and we raced to Belgium. We got there about 40 hours. Uh, in fact, it was, it was closer to two days that, that, we, that we got up there. And unloaded in it, uh, as soon as we got there, uh, had a little bit to eat and drink, and, and uh, I said, I remember sitting in a snowbank, big snow, deep snowbank, four o'clock in the morning, I'm sitting in a snowbank sucking on a frozen turkey leg. That was my Christmas dinner, 1944. Uh, in, in the morning, we got orders to head through some woods there was a lot of woods up there, very wooded area. Head through the woods, uh, our objective was a road junction about two or three miles down, through the woods down into a valley and grab a road junction. It was important to grab the, the transportation centers during a war like that. The bulls, the bulls, the, the Germans were still on the move. When the Germans hit the morning of September 16th, about 200,000 Germans came pouring through those woods. That's a lot of people, plus equipment, plus tanks. The 106th Division was in their way. That was the first division they hit. They destroyed it. They, they just absolutely destroyed it. Uh, 106th Division was written off because it was so badly damaged. It, it could not function. So we, we started off through the woods single file because the woods were so thick we couldn't go in, in, in columns. And we, we, we hiked all, the, well, uh, quite a few hours. It started in the morning. Uh, middle of the afternoon, as we're advancing, uh, we heard some machine gun fire behind us. 
and that told us immediately that we were cut off. And we knew Germans were on both sides of us. We knew Germans were in front of us, and now, now they were behind us. So the captain immediately ordered us to dig in. So we dug in in a circle, just like circling the wagons in the, in the Old West. We dug in uh, two men to a foxhole, maybe there were 35 or 40 foxholes, maybe 70 or 80 of us dug in there. And we didn't know how many Germans were around us, how, what, what was going to be thrown at us, but uh, we had to protect ourselves. That was the most important thing. So we dug in late that, late that afternoon. The even, evening was quiet. There was a huge, a tremendous over, overcast. It was so dark at night that you could not see your hand in front of your face. Uh, the Air Force was grounded, totally grounded. There were no planes flying because it was so dark. It was so, uh, this overcast was so thick and so, so dark. In the morning, the Germans, a German patrol came in to attack us. And of course, they're, 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 they're not sure who we are and what we are, so they wanted to send out some feelers. They sent a patrol in, and we repulsed the control patrol. We killed several of them. But after, after they left, we took a look around. Uh, they, they were Germans threw those potato masher grenades of theirs. One of them exploded near a foxhole and, and injured one of our men in the back of his head. Uh, the fellow in the foxhole right behind me, looking around, he was slumped down, so we went and checked on him. He had a bullet hole right between his eyes, one of the when the Germans are they, with their burp guns spraying the lead all, all over the place. So I, all we could do was pull the helmet down over his face and, and let him lay there for, we were, we were destined to be there for six days. And uh, uh, he, every time I looked around, there he was. And I just, I just hated to see that. But here we were, no food. No bedrolls, no blankets. All we had was the clothes on our back. We didn't. We didn't have overcoats. All day long, artillery shells were going over both directions. So you sit, sit there and hear, the, you know, as, as the shells go over. Uh, but again, the Germans did not attack us. We were we were uh, just a fly a fly on the ointment of them because they were on the move trying to get to Brussels, and so sure, sure they've got us in this little pocket sealed off. And they, they may have had 10 or 20 Germans keeping an eye on us, keeping us pinned down. We didn't, we never did find out. But uh, at night, there's 12 hours of darkness at night, and you and your buddy each get two hours on and two hours off. Two hours on, two, and you have to be awake when it's your two, your two hours on. You've got to be up and alert. And, and and when you get your turn, your two hours to lay down, you lay down on the bottom of the foxhole. You can't go to sleep right away. It, 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 it takes a bit to get to get your body to go to sleep. And at, there's action. The shells going over. There's machine guns down the road a half a mile, blasting away. And uh, uh, so you don't get your two hours sleep. It's impossible. And but you're still after maybe maybe you get an hour's sleep out of the two hours, so 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 we we were not rested at all. We were we were, we were tired all the time, we were cold all the time, we were hungry all the time. We had K rations, but that's not very satisfying. Well, we ran out of K rations on day by day three, so we have no food, we have no water. The snow is our water, so that's no problem. But we have no food. Uh, yeah. No rest, <laughs> and we're scared. I mean, it's, it's just nothing could be worse. <laughs> we're just in a lousy environment. So if we sent out a patrol on about day four. To, to, to there's a farm nearby in the woods. We didn't know a farm was there, but we heard a, a rooster crowing, so we knew there had to be a farm there. So we sent out a patrol on about day four, and they went out and uh, captured the four or five Germans in, in that farm, brought them back. And uh, I think they, the Germans were happy to be captured, to get get out of there, get it out of the war. Uh, so about day six, uh, the, the captain, the, air, the, the, the this huge fog lifted on about day six, and so the, so the air force was beginning to, to to blunt the nose of of the bulge, and and and, we, and these we, they were stopped. They could not advance any further. Uh, and the Air Force was very important in that. 
And so on day six, the captain said, let's, let's get out of here. Let's, 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 if we have to fight our way out, let's do it, but let's get out of here. So, but uh, we, we, finally got to, we finally got back to the American lines, which was wonderful. We got, we got uh, some warm food and uh, medical attention and rest. And, and it, just, it was just wonderful to, to be safe again. So that that was that was the end of the that was not the end of our experiences in the bulge, but that was our main experience. Uh, well, of course, the Siegfried Lang were all these cement, big cement domed, uh, not buildings, but they were the walls of the of these these stone. I mean, these cement buildings were about four feet thick. You couldn't you couldn't fire. The tank <clears throat> we had the tank destroyers with us, which are a tank chassis with a 90 millimeter gun on, which was great. And they, as we approached these dome buildings, they were built in such a way that they covered each other. They were in a series, and one could fire to cover the front of the other one. And so we would, we didn't get and try to get into their, let them get at us through their firing apertures. So we'd bring in these 90s millimeter guns, and they'd fire at the, at the side of one of these uh, igloos-like buildings, and it would, of course it couldn't penetrate, but it sure would wake up the guys inside and let them know that they're in trouble. And I think they were, they knew if they didn't surrender that they were going to be, they were going to die in there. Uh, so many of them surrendered that day. Uh, we d we did not suffer too many casualties as we went up. It was a slight up slight uphill development, and uh, so we were happy that that we weren't getting too much return fire. And they were they were they were happy to to surrender and get out of the war. So all day long we we had the the, the tank this tank destroyers firing at these buildings one after another. And uh, if if some decided to stay, we we would. Get the tank destroyers to fire at the aperture, which was the only opening into this, into this development, and they, that bullet would go, that shell would go in there is all kinds of hell. So, so we didn't have too much trouble. We got to the top of the of the hill finally, and we're and we're, we're on a hill looking down over the valley, a beautiful little valley. At the bottom of the valley is a town called Ormont, town of maybe five or six thousand people, and. The captain did not want us to go charging down the hill because it was open all the way, and with the Germans with down in the town with tanks and with machine guns firing at us. So he said, "I'm going to call in corps artillery." Now, if I got my figures straight, each army has so many corps in it. Each corps has so many divisions in it. So each and each division has artillery regiments attached to it. Two, two we had two, three thirty-fifth and three thirty-sixth. So these, this corps has so many big guns attached to it. And he, so when Captain called for corps artillery, that means every one of those guns is going to fire at a precise moment so that all those shells land on that town at the same exact moment. So after giving the command, I could hear a rumbling over the horizon just like thunder. And that's the big 240 long rifles firing. And then a second later, the 240 howitzers start firing. Then the 150 long rifles, then the 150 howitzers, then the 105 long rifles, then the 105 howitzers. I look, I can hear the, I can hear the shells going over. Normally, when one shell goes over, you can't see it, but so many shells were up there that I could catch the flickers of light as they went over. And looking down at the town, these 540 shells all arrived at the same second on top of that town, and it just lit up that town like you, you wouldn't believe. Greatest sight I ever saw in my life, and, and just it just destroyed the town. The, the roofs of every building were dancing, and smoke was pouring out, and dust. It was just the Germans must have been totally shocked to have such a tremendous, intense amount of, of artillery come down on there at the one moment. They must they couldn't believe it that probably that we could expend that many shells. So, so we went tearing down the hill. Right, all of us shoulder to shoulder, firing from the hip. The tank destroyers running along, right, clanking along right beside us. And so we got down to the town, and the Germans had fled. This, this, what, what happened to them? What happened to them? They fled. Uh, 
so we moved and took over the town. <clears throat> my number two man in my squad was, was a, came from a German city in, in the Dakotas. He could speak German fluently, so, so we found an old couple down in the basement of one of the homes, very old, fa old house at that time, maybe in their 60s or 70s, who knows. But uh, so he, he questioned them. And this woman, she was shaking, still shaking. She said she thought it was so intense, she thought it was the end of the world. She really did. It was so much the noise, the, the, the destruction. It was a great sight, but it was the easiest way, a good way to settle a battle. Instead of fighting hand to hand, let's, let's just obliterate it, which we did. So that was my experience in the in the Seafree line, it was violent and, and quick, and uh, but it, it was not an obstacle to our progress. Remagen was, in our opinion, was it was a day at the beach compared to what we what we had. You were under heavy fire. Yeah, we 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 went. Uh, we got to the Rhine River. We we stationed. We put men in each, every, about every third or fourth house, we had put a, put a half a dozen men up and down the river just to, to make sure the Germans coming back, and we weren't afraid of them coming back. The German snipers opened up on us the first day. One of our boys found a motorcycle, and he's on the back streets of, of the town, of the town of Niederspey. The river's, say, 250 yards wide. The town's about 200 yards deep, and he's back here tootling along. We had, we had gasoline, naturally, so he could activate this machine. So he's tootling along, and a sniper from over here knocked him off that motorcycle. 600, 650-yard rifle shot. That's, that's good shooting. Oh, shoot. he's moving. <laughs> yes, that's, that's good shooting. The next day, uh, one of our lieutenants was running from one building to another, and a, and a sniper nailed him right in the back, right below the ear. Came out, the bullet came out here, so he lived. In fact, he died recently in Texas. Texas. So after that, nobody stuck their nose out of their buildings. Just keep it. In our building, we found about four big crates of liquor, plenty of slow gin, dry gin, vodka. Not vodka. Vodka wasn't invented. Yet. Slow gin, dry gin, brandy, wines. We we just we just said let's stay here for a month or two. Let's not cross the river. The heck with that. <laughs> so, but but. Uh, but we did. So one night, one day, the word came down. Okay, get across the river tonight. So some of the guys got rested, rested up. Some of them cleaned their weapons. Some of them wrote letters home. In some cases, I'm sure those letters arrived after the telegram from the War Department telling them that their husband or son was killed. Uh, so about 11 o'clock that night, we left that home. Went up to the back streets. We couldn't. We didn't walk in the waterfront on the back street. Walked down. We were about a mile north of the at castle, where the castle was. We're going to cross below the castle. So we got down there about 11:30, quarter to 12. The engineers had brought 16 little boats, uh, maybe eight or nine feet long, maybe that wide, about that deep, little skulls, you might call them going to put eight men in each one of these boats. Each boat had eight paddles in the, laying it down in the middle of it. And you, each man picked up a paddle and put his rifle down there in the middle of the boat. So at, at about uh, 5 to 12, the captain came up to me and said, Moran, I want a radio in your boat. Now the radio in those days was a, about a 20-pound unit on a, strapped onto a guy's back. And, this, and so Frank Nagel was, was the radio man. So the captain said, you take Frank, give me one of your men. So I gave him Willard Campion, who was going to be my number three man, sitting right behind me. I'm number one, number two is over here, number three right behind me. So I put Frank right behind me, and at, and at midnight, right on the nose, we pushed off very quiet, trying to be quiet, but you can't move 140 men quietly, it's impossible. So, but we get out, start paddling across the river. We get out in the middle of the river, and the Germans, through a great number of flares, lit up the river beautifully, just like daylight. It op opened up on us with five heavy machine guns. Uh, the, the minute the first machine gun fired, I could, uh oh, uh oh, up and down the line, uh oh, <laughs> the guys. And so, 
when these five machines opened up, it was a tremendous din, noise, and, and we're starting to paddle. I can feel bad. I can feel bullets hitting my paddle, uh, bullets hitting our boat. Uh, the, I heard swearing. I heard praying, and the boats, as, as one side of a boat would riddle, it would start to spin, and the boats were colliding with each other, and. It, it was just, it was a mess. Uh, one bullet just skinned me here and hit Frank Nagel in the heart. Frank fell over on top of me dead because of man, Just my luck, I could have put Frank anywhere in that boat I wanted, but I put him in the number three spot and he's dead five minutes later. There, there's, there's good luck in war and there's bad luck in war. Another bullet skinned me here and hit my number six man. And as I was dipping, I, I was screaming at my men, dig, 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 meaning dig those paddles. I, I was down like this, and another burst one just over my head. The engineer was standing up in the back of the boat, as, as all the engineers did, one engineer in each boat, and the, he was just riddled and toppled over into the, into the river. I was, I was surrounded by machine gun bullets. Uh, so I, I just kept screaming at my men, dig, and we finally pulled out of the mess that was being caused, the traffic jam, and got, got, got away. And we got, we, did, we got across the river, was what was left in our boat, hit the beach, jump, jumped out of our boat, and as with, not, and with other boats up in, up in our group, these 16 boats, I'm sure there were dead men in, in any number of the boats. And we, we didn't bother pulling the boat up on the beach. We, we, that was the least of our worries, just jump out of the boat, the boat went spinning down the river. They were, they were pulling boats and bodies out of the river, I'm sure, for a couple of days. Uh, but we, 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 were, we laid down on the ground. We, we were so exhausted emotionally, physically, psychologically. We were, we'd just been through hell. And but we, so we rested for just a couple of minutes, which, which helped laying on this, this very shallow beach. And somehow a signal came to us to get up and attack. I don't know what the signal was. I don't, don't remember hearing a signal, but we all got up. <coughs> and we were advancing into a town called Braubach, which surrounded Castle Marksburg up on top of the hill. And it's, it's, it's dark. It's, it's, of course, it's, it's just 12, 12.30 at night. But we all started firing from the hip, just just shooting into the darkness. You got there about 70 of us left out of the 140. Half of us survived, and and we're firing just firing into the dark. And we're, I've calculated between this, we're firing about 3,500 rounds a minute into this into the dark, and which is an effective field of fire. And we're waist high. If, if and there were, but there were Germans in the foxholes along the bank. And we did run into them. Uh, they they did kill kill a couple of our guys. They wounded some of. The, I'm in touch with a guy named Berlin Hoppy down in Ohio right now. He was uh, he came up the beach. He was wounded immediately by a, a German, but but Merlin kept on going with with bazooka even though he was wounded, and put a, a bazooka around in one of the machine guns, and so that that was a big help. My platoon leader knocked out several machine gun nests uh, and was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross that night. So, so, so we got we cleared the the, the, the the resistant area and got to the got to the edge of building. And, and so we're we're down we're down below the castle and we're we're back our backs are against these buildings so we're out we're, we're safe temporarily safe. The Germans now up on the castle, up on top of the hill, had anti-aircraft guns up there, and they pointed those down. So they're firing. In addition to the mortars coming in, they're firing 20 millimeter anti-aircraft shells at us, which explode on contact. One guy, one of our guys, got hit on the helmet, took his head off. It was just ter terrible, da damaging. So we, uh, we we stayed there until dawn broke, <coughs> and. But since the, the river is clear, some reinforcements can now start coming across the river uh, in bigger boats with motors, et cetera. But, uh, but we, had, we had cleared the way for them to, to come.